Today we welcome Diran Punisami, CEO of the Median Group. Diran and I have the same alma mater, so I'm personally very excited to have him on our series. The Median Group, as we know, has been a major player in the sugar and cane industry for over a century now, and recently has been a much more diversified group with activities in education, leisure, agriculture, and of course, property. Diran, welcome to Anderson. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Fazil. Thank you for having me and um, the opportunity to share my thoughts. And thank you to Anderson for this excellent initiative to have this series of podcasts. Thank you. Diran, let's go straight into it. You've taken the reins of the Median Group last year in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, a major challenge in itself, so well done for that. What's your outlook for the group now that the country is starting to breathe again? Although, uh, let's not forget we are still in the middle of, of lots of difficulties with new headwinds like you know the rising prices the war in ukraine that no one expected you know four or five months ago how are all of these having an implication on the outlook for the group yeah um so yeah i mean absolutely i mean i took over the reins um actually 10 days into the first lockdown in 2020 um so it was a baptism by fire as they say um We've had to do a lot of restructuring since, um, because the, at the time that I took over the group, um, the group's balance sheet was completely decimated. So there was a huge restructuring effort um, to be done. Now I'm pleased that we are well past that, 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 that restructuring exercise and we're actually ahead of the time that, that we set. And we can now look forward um, to, to the growth of the business and, 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 and how we grow um, the group into different spheres of activity. Um, you know, the economic situation has not been kind to us. Um, every time you, you, you feel that you're coming out um, of the challenge, uh, a new challenge um, arises. And as you've said, uh, we all thought that the reopening of borders in October uh, was going to be the catalyst um, for growth. And then we saw the emergence of Omicron and then subsequently the, the war in Ukraine. Um, but I, I must say, things are slowly picking up. Um, we're invested in four sectors of activity. Um, so as you know, we have real estate, we've got um, leisure, we have agriculture and, and education. Um, the tailwinds that are pushing those four sectors are actually operating at a different pace. Um, so if I look at real estate, um, it's the sector that's actually come out of the crisis. Uh, it's bounced back fastest. Um, and some of the macro challenges, um, such as inflation and the depreciation of the rupee, is actually help helping the sector. Um, so real estate is seen as a store of value, so inflation expectations pushes people to, to invest in, in real estate. Um, conversely, the depreciation of the rupee means that um, real estate offerings to foreigners becomes more accessible. So that sector, I think, is, um, is poised to benefit uh, from the macro challenges that, that, that you refer to. Um, on the on the leisure side, it's a bit trickier because I think the whole hospitality sector is waiting for tourism to pick up and, and tourist arrivals to, to reach cruising altitude. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and we'll have to see how it evolves. Um, there are positive signs. Um, the depreciation of rupee will help to some extent in terms of competitiveness, um, but we'll have to see. Um, education is, um, is a sector which has been probably more resilient, I would say, um, but in terms of, of, of near-term and medium-term outlook, it's, it's positive because our education business is geared towards Africa. Um, what we are betting on is the demand that will come from the continent that has a very young population, uh, has, will have a huge demand for tertiary education, good tertiary education. We know that the continent will not be able to supply um, that demand and we want to be part of that supply. Um, so I think the dynamics there are positive and we've seen that business go, go in that direction. Agriculture, it's funny because agriculture a few years ago used to be a naughty child. Uh, put it in the corner because it, you know, it was a loss-making business. Um, it was very hard to actually find professionals who want to work in agriculture. But through this pandemic, it's seen a rejuvenation almost. Um, you know, suddenly agriculture has taken center stage and people are more interested in it. Um, yes, there's been the measures of bagasse pricing by the government, which is very positive and, and has given a new lifeline to, to the cane sector. But I think more broadly, um, the themes of um, food security, uh, import substitution, and more consciousness around 
the carbon footprint of imports has meant that there's more interest in agriculture as um, as a pillar or as a sector in which uh, that has that has prospects, and we're seeing that now. There's there's more consciousness around. You know, people are more conscious about what they eat, um, what's in their food, the carbon footprint element, and as we see carbon being priced for what it is, uh, we should see some opportunities in agriculture as well. So it's, that's sort of the, the overview of how I see the, the, the four sectors of Midian today. So it's, it's uh, definitely beneficial to have a diversified portfolio when you face challenges like these, because you are able to offset some of the gains or some of the losses in some sectors against potential gains in others, where there are sort of opposite sort of forces or dynamics that are, uh, that are in play. Absolutely. You know, there's, um, uh, there's, a, there's a famous American hedge fund, um, Bill Ackman, who once said that um, di uh, diversification is the hedge against ignorance. Um, I don't think you have that luxury here in Mauritius. We're a small island, so you do have to diversify in order to protect yourself. So, so yes, um, I think that that's stands true. And I like your comments about uh, the, the agriculture and the food sector. We had uh, Lawrence Wong. Um, on this series earlier on, Lawrence, the CEO of Latrobe, and he was talking about sort of similar ideas and similar developments in the food sector in Mauritius. So very, very encouraging to hear that. Darren, I want to touch on, on two of the, the, the four sort of sectors that you mentioned. I'll come to education um, in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the real estate, because Medin has suddenly grown big in that, that, that space over the last few years. You mentioned, and I was looking at your annual report for the group last year, that Medin's long-term strategy, I quote, is to develop its land bank in ways that generate sustainable value for its stakeholders, end of quote. Now, with more than over 10,000 hectares of land, actually, in a very desirable part of the island, um, as a major landowner, you've got this ability to really shape the west coast of Mauritius for years to come, the next 10, 20 years. And if we reflect on how Medin has been the pioneer of projects like the IRS some 15 years ago, like the Education Hub as well, what can we expect to see in 10, 20 years' time? Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. Our strategic intent is to shape the West positively and sustainably. Um, we're fortunate enough that you know, people see Medin as the West and the West as Medin. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but certainly, I think, you know, if you look over a long period of time, um, our stakeholders have come to see us as a force for good in the West, and we need to continue being that force for good. Um, 10,000 hectares, if you put that in relative terms, it's 6% of the land mass of Mauritius. So 6% is, is a relatively big number. So we've been entrusted with a, with a responsibility, and that's why the word sustainability is key here, because when you're entrusted with 6% of an island, you have a, a, a social and, and, and sustainability responsibility. Um, you know, as I look at the development, certainly me as CEO today, uh, it's important that we don't commit the mistakes of the past. Um, and I talk about some of the challenges that we had to restructure, etc. So as we execute forward, we have to make sure we do it with a greater degree of precision. Um, but by and large, if you look at what we've done in the West, it's in line with the master plan that we established in 2005. Um, so we see the, you know, the use of words as smart cities, etc. today. Um, but that only dates back to five years ago when the scheme was, was, was launched. The smart city or the city of Medin um, predates that. Uh, it's part of a long-term plan that we established in 2005. So you know, what we'll see is a continuity of that development. Uh, we will see the growth of the city. Uh, we're making good progress on that front, but we will do it in a, in a measured way. Um, and you will see the West transform into um, a place where people want to come and live, work, um, and enjoy. Um, but beyond that, I think where we can also play a big role um, is in terms of renewable energy. Um, when you think about renew renewable energy today, um, it will require land. Uh, we are well positioned to play a, a big role in, in, in that space, and, and that's, that's the area where I think we want to position ourselves going forward. Very interesting. And um, last week we had uh, Jyoti Jitten from the Montfazi Group talking about uh, uh, reshaping the, the north of the island and we're 
blessed to have you today talking about reshaping the West of the island. It's very promising, and I think everyone's looking forward to, you know, the the, the future of the island and the future of the the landscape of the island. Um, let me touch on education, and and I've got this very um, sort of pertinent question that that I want to ask you. Of course, Medin has invested significantly in education, uh, and it's very encouraging to see the development of this relatively new sector, and, and even more encouraging to hear about your prospects for Africa, which I think is a, is a land of opportunity, certainly for Mauritius. However, looking back at the, the traditional education system in Mauritius, the, the, the primary education system, the secondary system, it is um, open to a lot of criticism today, uh, from from many sort of parties and many sort of different stakeholders, the trust I feel that used to exist in our education system, from the curriculum to the teaching methods to the structure that used to exist, is gradually being eroded. I want to ask you: um, Do we have an education system today that you think is fit for purpose? And if not, what needs to change? Mm -hmm. I think. Perhaps what was fit for purpose post-independence has not evolved with the times. Um, let's be honest. Um, this does not. This is not a, uh, an observation um, of today or a year from now. Um, it's been the case for over two decades. The pandemic has just laid bare what we already knew and it's exposed the divide that exists between public and private education today. But it's always been there. Um, you know, and and you know, I'll just give you a few numbers just to um, illustrate that point. In the UK, 6% of um, the student population are in private education. And that number has stayed pretty static over the years. It's really, it's, it, it, it has stayed um, stale 6%. In Mauritius today, 15% of students in the primary um, sector are in private education. A few years ago, that number was 9%. When you and I were at school, it was less than 1%. Um, so you can see the trend. And if you extrapolate this forward, I think it's fair to say that by the time you get to mid-century, the majority of students in Mauritius will be in private education. So that's the core start. Um, it's a fact, you can't deny it. Um, and, you know, I'm not a believer in big government. I believe in, in small government. I believe that when government crowds out um, space that private sector could, um, could play in, you end up with inefficiency. Um, so the answer, in a way, lies in l'état des lieux, um, because privatization is happening by stealth. We can either recognize it and accelerate it, so, but it's really important that as we do that, we also ensure that um, it's done in a way that um, is socially fair and equitable, because um, we need to maintain the principle of access to education to all. That's, I think, a non-negotiable uh, principle. Um, but I think, you know, we can either leave privatization happen by stealth, or we can take the reins and actually do it in a, in a much more structured way and accelerate it. And I think that's, you know, for me, is, is the way forward. Um, we, can't, we can't reverse what's already happening. Thank you, Diren. Let's turn our attention now to the national budget, which is not far off now. You reacted very positively to last year's budget. Um, I read about some of your comments and you were very um, complimentary about the, the measures introduced to reboot the economy, the acceleration of green energy development, faster access to uh, foreigners to come and settle in Mauritius. Given the current economic context today, what are your expectations for the forthcoming budget? Hmm. Well, I think, you know, you, you made reference to my comments last year and a lot of people have um, commented on that as well. I think it's important as the private sector that we recognize positive measures when they are announced and, and implemented. Um, and mourning should not become a national sport, right? So I think we need to be constructive in, in, in how we engage. Um, you know, there were a lot of good things uh, that were announced that, uh, you know, back as transfer pricing, uh, measures that impacted education uh, to boost real estate, etc. Um, but I think, you know, as we look to the, to the budget this year, 
there are, for me, some, some, some structural things that we need to, to address. Um, you know, you, you're a better position than me to talk about the, the, the list of, you know, of measures that will impact a number of sectors. But if I had two wild cards, um, they would be the following. Um, I think population growth is the single biggest um, structural challenge that we have today. Um, you know, we've seen the population decline for the first time, uh, I believe, in December. Um, and that's, that's a huge concern. Um, you know, if anything, that's the challenge that we need to, to address because without population growth, nothing else matters. As a, as a private sector stakeholder, how can I make investment decisions for the next 15, 20, 25 years when I don't know what will be the size of my market or worse, if I think my, my market is going to shrink? Um, so, you know, I've spoken in the past in, in the previous annual report about immigration uh, because we have to face the fact that the only way to have population growth is to encourage immigration into Mauritius. Um, I think to be fair, um, previous budgets have had measures to um, encourage immigration, but I think we need to be a lot more aggressive. We need to have very clear targets that we want to set in terms of population growth by 2025, by 2030, and clear measures that will help us achieve those, um, those goals. Um, and so for me, if, if there was nothing else, that would be the one, um, the one structural measure I would like to see. Um, the second one is, we've spoken about green energy earlier, um, and I think, you know, the government last year announced a 60% target uh, of renewable energy by, um, by 2030. Now, I'm amongst those who think that achieving that target is possible. In fact, I think it can be achieved before 2030, but not with the current framework. Um, so it's great to have a header that says we want to achieve this, but we need the, the framework to help us achieve that, that goal. Um, so the current process of you know, having uh, bids by the CEB and a you know, long process, um, I don't think we'll get there. Uh, if we keep methods of yesteryear to tackle um, an ambition of today. Um, simple things like a framework that sets a very clear price for the cost, for the price at which um, the, the, the regulator is willing to buy solar energy, willing to buy uh, wind energy, or a hybrid of this with batteries, set a price competitively, realistic of course, and allow the private sector to go and bring the latest technology, the expertise that is required to fit that into a business model. And if you do that, I think you will see a plethora of, 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 of various investments in renewable happening across the island, and we will achieve that target much earlier than, than we set out. So what I'd like to see is a change in the framework. Um, so here you go. If I had two to pick, will, these would be the two. Thank you. Very insightful, Diren. Um, I want to end with um, a question which is you know, partly personal, partly uh, very relevant to the situation that we face today. You know, you yourself, you've had a very rich international career uh, before returning to Mauritius. You've worked in, in Asia, in Africa, it's taken you to, I mean, you started in Europe. And then you've come back, you've talked about it previously, you know, for your own personal reasons. Mauritius today faces a shortfall of talent in various sectors, let's face it, um, and would benefit enormously from people like yourself with that type of experience coming back and, and work and, 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 and help the development of the island. Now, it is true that people take decisions based on their personal circumstances, we can't force that, but what is your message to fellow Mauritians abroad who are not sure whether it is the right thing to come back and work in Mauritius, w help to develop you know, our, our island. And bearing in mind that we are in a situation where even today we face a, a brain drain of, of qu qualified professionals like London's lawyers who are being seduced by places like Malta, like Luxembourg, like the Channel Islands. And uh, it's, it's, a, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger as a problem to, you know, I want to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah. So, 
So there are many themes here. Um, um, I, I think, first of all, I think we should be, it should be a source of national pride that we have a diaspora that is, um, you know, across the world, um, who have been successful across different sectors. Um, we've got merchant professionals today operating in every sphere of activity, going from aeronautics to mining and what have you. Um, so I think it should be a source of national pride that we have such talent um, operating across the globe. Um, it shouldn't also be an objective to bring all of them back because we don't have opportunities for all sectors. Um, now, whether you like it or not, when you decide to come back to Mauritius, you make a financial trade-off. There's no going around that. Um, I made that trade-off. Um, and I think you know, any member of the diaspora looking to come back will have to make that trade-off. But you have to balance it against something else. Um, and that something else is quality of life. Um, I think it's fair to say that the quality of life in Russia, especially when you have family, um, is much better than some of the other you know, countries that I can think um, of. And I think that's the balance, that everybody needs to make that balance and, and, and determine whether it's the right move for them. You know, incentives, you know, we do have incentives to attract um, that ice pourer back. So I don't think there's more than government can do in that space. I think what we have is is more than adequate. But you, you, you pointed out to something that's much more relevant. It's all well and good to say, how do we attract the diaspora back? But what if you can't retain your talent that's already here? Um, because these are two different problems. Um, and today we are seeing a brain drain. We're seeing a brain drain in the hospitality sector. We're seeing a brain drain in the financial services sector, which obviously you have a better view on. Um, so it, it's not just about tackling how you attract people in. It's also how do you retain the talent that's actually here. Um, and the fact of the matter is the, the high tax environment has pushed a lot of people away. Um, and that needs to be addressed. Um, if we're not competitive in terms of the tax environment uh, that we practice, um, then of course, you know, young talent will see better opportunities elsewhere in low tax jurisdictions where they have better services, etc. So we need to make the environment here competitive and attractive to our own talent before we think about attracting others into the country. So I think that's, you know, that, that's, that's for me fundamental. Um, but coming back to diaspora, I also think that, you know, within the private sector, we need to create opportunities for the diaspora. It's not up to government to do that, it's up to us. So my message to my fellow colleagues in, in the private sector would be, create opportunities for the diaspora, see the diaspora through the same lens that you see expatriates. All too often, we prefer an expatriate over a member of the diaspora. Um, we're prepared to pay an expatriate more than a member of the diaspora. But you have to remember, that person, when they're operating in London, in New York, or wherever it is, they are seen exactly the same as the Brit, or the American, or the French person. So we have to remove those different lenses that we have locally and, and, and see our own talent for what they are. And that starts within the private sector. It's not a, it's not a national effort. It's, uh, we all have a part to play um, in that space. Thanks a lot, Diron, for those insights. I think these are very relevant. I can relate to them myself from my own experience. And I think they will resonate with a lot of people in similar situations. And I hope you know, employers uh, in, in the private sector across the island uh, are uh, listening to this and will take on board some of these, I think, very relevant thoughts and very relevant comments. So thanks again for sharing your, your experience. Duren, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us here on this series. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Fazil. It's been an honor for me. And uh, thank you for, again for the opportunity to come here and, and share those thoughts. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching and see you next week when we welcome another CEO in the hot seat. Bye for now. Thank you.